Hello lovelies, in this video Tim is going to be looking at anorexia for your A-level psychology. Now there are lots of facts and studies in this video that you're going to need to be able to remember and quote for your exam. So to help you with that, over my website there is a massive course full of facts and figures and dates to help you revise. Anorexia nervosa is more commonly known as anorexia to the general public. It's one of the most widespread eating disorders found anywhere in the world, and specifically in the UK. Anorexia is, as many people know, much more likely to affect women. It affects roughly one in every 250 women at some point in their lives. That said, however, anorexia can indeed be found in men, albeit at a much lower, less prevalent rate. At some point in their lives, roughly one in 2,000 men will suffer from anorexia. Anorexia is also much more likely to affect teenagers, and specifically teenagers at the older end of that age bracket. That's 16 to 17 years old. It's much more likely to affect 16 to 17 year olds than any other age group at all. The consequences of anorexia can be extremely serious. Severe and sustained weight loss, long-lasting dietary problems, anxiety, paranoia, and even death can all result from anorexia. The DSM, that's the Standard Manual of Diagnostics for Psychology, which lists the main characteristics of many conditions, gives three main diagnostic characteristics for anorexia nervosa. The first is a restriction of energy intake. The individual routinely, and for a long, sustained period of time, takes in less calories than is normal, or even than is required for normal bodily function. This can lead to sudden and drastic weight loss. Simply put, the individual doesn't take in enough food, or at least enough calories, and becomes very thin very quickly. This can obviously have huge medical consequences. The second diagnostic characteristic is a fear of weight gain. The individual will often have a completely irrational, unrealistic, and unexplainable fear of gaining any weight whatsoever for any reason. This will often happen despite this individual being severely, perhaps even dangerously, underweight. This can often have severe consequences and can lead to the individual exhibiting behaviours which cause them to lose even more weight, such as excessive levels of physical activity. They may run all the time out of an obsessive need to try and lose even more weight. Obviously, this can be extremely dangerous. The weight loss can snowball to a point where it is difficult to get back. Lastly, the third diagnostic characteristic of anorexia is a distorted and extreme body image. The individual will usually have a very distorted image of themselves and their own body. From this, they may make judgments about their worth and value as a person and an individual in society based only on their weight or their outward appearance. They may also refuse to accept, despite all available evidence, that they are underweight and keep claiming that they are fine even as they waste away. They may also become fixated, again against all rational evidence, that they are obese or disgusting. There are two main biological explanations for anorexia. These are genetic explanations and neural or neurological explanations. Holland, leading a group of researchers in 1988, tried to explain anorexia using genetics, and specifically using the genetic relationship between twins. To do this, the concordance rates of anorexia were looked into in 45 pairs of twins. Concordance rates are how often a condition in one twin appears in the other one. In each pair, at least one of the two twins had been diagnosed with anorexia nervosa. This study looked to see how many times the other twin had presented with the same disorder. The study found that the concordance rates for anorexia were 56% for identical, sometimes also known as MZ twins, but only 5% for non-identical or DZ twins, a difference of 51%. From this, a clear conclusion can be drawn. The conclusion is that anorexia has at least a partly genetic basis. If one twin in a pair, especially of identical twins, suffers from it, it is extremely likely at 56% that the other one will do too, but only as long as these twins are identical and have a large amount of shared DNA. That said, there are some issues with this theory. The sample size for this particular study was extremely small, only 45 pairs of twins or 90 people. It's entirely possible that some other shared factor or characteristic with identical twins may be the root cause. This could be a range of things, such as a shared parentage or a shared environment in which they grew up. 
The second possible biological explanation for anorexia is neural. Researchers has also suggested a possible neural cause, that being damage to the hypothalamus. As we've seen, some studies using rats have suggested that lesions or severe damage to the lateral hypothalamus, or LH, may be responsible for changes in appetite, hunger, and our perceptions of food and food intake. People suffering from anorexia do also seem to have abnormally high levels of serotonin. Serotonin is a hormone which, in excessive amounts, can cause anxiety. There are a wide range of possible reasons for serotonin to be released, but one of those reasons is the intake of food. It's possible that not eating may prevent the release of serotonin, and therefore actually make people suffering from anorexia feel less anxious, and therefore feel better, and this may be the root cause of their reluctance to eat, and therefore the root cause of their anorexia. In addition to biological explanations for anorexia, there are a number of psychological ones. The first of these is the family systems theory. This explanation is predominantly environmental. It focuses on the family. Some studies have found that anorexia may indeed be linked to parental behaviours and more specifically parental expectations. Individuals who suffer from anorexia often have parents who are extremely controlling or have very high expectations of their children. Minashin, leading a group of researchers in 1978, did find a strong link between anorexia in children and the influence of the family and parents. Specifically, this study uncovered three often displayed behaviours in the families of anorexic individuals. That's not to say these were always present, but they were common. The first is known as enmeshment. The families often had a very strong emotional connection and shared bond. This led to a shared sense of identity and very little individual growth outside of the family environment or individual personalities within it. The second displayed behaviour or characteristic was overprotectiveness. These families were often extremely overprotective. They were therefore, albeit out of the best of intentions, very controlling of children within the family, to an extreme extent which prevented any autonomous development and expression. This led to the children not gaining their own identities, reinforcing the enmeshment. The third displayed characteristic was rigidity. The families often had very rigid and dogmatic beliefs. This tended to especially be true about family identity, and especially family loyalty and loyalty to the family group. Obviously, partly, this could be cultural. Different cultures have different levels of dogmatic beliefs within families. Families of this type and families that display these types of behaviours often maintain a normal outward appearance, but they are actually unable to manage any differences within the family or conflict between individuals. The theory goes that this can lead to personality disorders, such as anorexia in children, as the children are unable to manage conflict. This theory is backed by some research evidence, but like all theories, it also has drawbacks. It seeks to blame the family rather than focusing on helping the individual. It also completely ignores the presence of anorexia in adults and focuses entirely on children. It cannot therefore be a complete explanation. Social learning theory is an alternative explanation for anorexia. Like family systems theory, it is predominantly psychological and focuses on behaviour. However, unlike family theory, social learning focuses on the wider social and cultural environment rather than just a specific individual or their wider family. Social learning theory states that we model our own behaviour based on what we see and what we experience around us in our everyday lives. In Western societies especially, but not only, cultural depictions of beauty very often revolve around being thin sometimes to an unhealthy extent. This is especially true in fashion and media, and indeed is especially true of the way girls and young women are portrayed. It is completely natural and normal for all of us to try and imitate, in whatever ways we can, those we look up to and admire. Young girls are especially vulnerable to imitating these cultural role models set by the media. This can lead them to thinking that thinness, as displayed, for example, in fashion models, is the only useful standard for beauty, value, and self-worth, and they can begin to define themselves entirely using those characteristics. As these role models, such as movie stars, pop singers, and supermodels, seem to be happy, seem to be rich, and often outwardly appear to be successful and happy, many young people feel that they can achieve the same type of lifestyle and levels of happiness by imitating that behaviour and displayed characteristics, taking these pop stars, movie stars and supermodels as a role model for their own life. As a society, we can be complicit in this. 
We often compound it by complimenting individuals if they seem to have lost weight in a way which is at least attempted to be innocent, but can lead individuals down a dark path. This can reinforce the behavior and this can lead people to repeat it. Eventually, once this behavior sets in, they get trapped and this causes anorexia. Keel and Klump in 2003 did find a link between the levels of westernization in media outlets within a country and the levels of anorexia among individuals within that country. Thus, social learning theory does provide at least a partial explanation for the correlation between the expansion of media in the 21st century and information age and rises in the rates of anorexia, especially among young girls. This link is backed by some research evidence too. That said, as always, this is not a complete explanation. Everybody, regardless of their gender or age, is exposed to the same media and the same overall culture within a country. If social learning theory was the only cause for anorexia, then everyone would have anorexia. Patently, this is not the case. And since this is not the case, social learning theory cannot be an exclusive and complete explanation, and there must be other factors involved. The third and final psychological explanation for anorexia is known as cognitive theory. Cognitive theory states that individuals who are suffering from anorexia have a distorted or irrational image of the world around them. This, in turn, can lead to a set of distorted and irrational perceptions and beliefs about themselves, their own self-image and self-belief, and even their overall identity. How they see themselves, how they see the world around them, and critically how they see themselves fitting into that world around them. Cognitive theory therefore suggests four things. The first is that Individuals may believe that they are fat or overweight or obese, even when they are dangerously underweight. Secondly, individuals may well construct delusional beliefs about their self-worth based entirely on a narrow set of beliefs around eating and the control of their own eating. Thirdly, individuals may hold distorted and irrational views, not based on logic, about food, the intake of food and eating, body image and body shape in a wider society context. Fourthly and finally, individuals may form views about themselves which are completely dependent and informed by a very narrow and restrictive set of these delusional factors. Often in the case of anorexia, these factors will be completely determined by their appearance and weight and they will use those to determine their own view of their self-worth within society. This is delusional and irrational but makes internal logical sense to them based on their delusional beliefs about society. Cognitive theory does focus on the individual in ways that other theories don't. Many other theories focus on the family or focus on wider society. Therefore, cognitive theory is a much more humanistic explanation of anorexia, but it does ignore wider factors such as the media and society. As with most things, it's entirely probable that the actual explanation for anorexia is a compound of all the factors we've looked at in this video.